to do this. My name is Doris Haddock, live outside Dublin, New Hampshire, and belong to a study group, the Tuesday Morning Academy. Nineteen of us, mostly retired, set on the idea of learning something new. And we had studied in great detail the financing of political campaigns and were quite concerned as to whether there could really be a representative democracy under today's conditions. But there was hope. The McCain-Feingold Campaign Finance Reform Bill was coming up for a vote in the Senate. And the Senate failed to pass it. I said to the girls, <coughs> I am terribly distressed about what is happening to our government. It seems like the rich have taken it over, and you can't get elected unless you have millions of dollars. Our wonderful leader said, Well, Doris, what are you going to do about it? Me? For heaven's sake, what can I do about it? Well, what can you do? So, at the next meeting of the Academy, I had a plan ready. Girls, we may be small, but we can be mighty. We can organize or get others to organize petitions all over the United States to demand campaign finance reform and send them to their senators. Are you game? Let's go. Well, it took us two hard, long years, but we did it. Tens of thousands of petitions were sent to senators all across the United States. And what we got back from one of our senators was a form letter. The other senator didn't bother to respond. I gave him a call. Senator, this is Doris Haddock. Haddock, like the fish. The Tuesday Morning Academy has sent you thousands of petitions demanding campaign finance reform, and you haven't even bothered. You never received the petitions. I'll send you fresh copies. No response. I am an old Yankee accustomed to calling up her congressman, her representative, and getting things moving. I didn't know what else to do. Finally, one day my son, Jim, was driving me about, and I saw an old, old man walking by himself on the highway with a little knapsack. Jim, Jim, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk all the way across the United States to call attention to the need for campaign finance reform. And I will talk to people along the way about how our government is being bought out from under us. And I will round up some votes for reform in Congress. 
poor Jim. He nearly drove off the road. Oh, boy. But he thought about it, and the day before he left for his annual fishing trip to the Everglades, he gave me a list of several tasks and said if I would do those things, he would support my project. So, to get in shape, I walked 10 miles day in and day out with a 25 pound backpack. It was filled with beans. I practiced sleeping on the ground without whining about it and mapped out my cross country trek with the help of AAA and two geologists. And that winter, my son Jim made airline arrangements for Los Angeles, and the day after Christmas, we flew there, and I began my work signature gathering on Santa Monica Beach. <laughs> then Ken Heckler, remember that name, because he was West Virginia's octogenarian Secretary of State, heard of my plans and wanted to support the walk. So on January 1st, 1999, we started the trek together right behind the Rose Bowl Parade. <laughs> Woo -hoo! And when the parade turned, we just kept on walking out toward the desert with a little old van following. And I became known as Granny D. Now, just in case some of you are thinking, big deal, let me tell you a few things. I did that walk. I talked to people along the way. Many times I walked alone and many times I walked with others. But I had a bad back with a steel back brace, arthritis particularly in the feet, and I am short and old. But it was a grand experience, and I would like to take you on some of it. Let's begin. First of all, the Great Mojave Desert. And oh my, if you can pretend this right now, you are better than I am. But it was hot. And I walked, and I walked. And I thought about my late husband, Jim, who died after a long, difficult illness. After 62 years together, I couldn't think of anything I might enjoy. But I walked on. Oh, and I must tell you, you see this dead fox? Well, all the way across, the number of dead animals was quite constant. And the carcasses often fascinating. Every mile was a biology lesson. <laughs> and I walked on. Arizona, hot in the daytime and freezing at night. And the wind blew and blew. It blew off my head. <coughs> to my lungs. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. A side trip to a hospital near Salome, and I was told that I had pneumonia and that I would die if I was stupid enough to continue this trek. I had rather die than sit at home in my rocking chair wondering why I didn't even try. I left and I walked on the Sonoran Desert and then finally onto Phoenix, Arizona, where I was to meet with the Senator Kyle 
the first senator on my trip who was against campaign finance reform. I gave a short talk outside his office, but he refused to meet with me publicly, which did not sit too well with assembled supporters. The lady has walked 400 miles. Can't he take a few steps to greet her in public? Come on, come on. Well, he would not come out. We left. Chandler, Arizona, and then Indian lands. After a long, hot walk through the reservation, we finally arrived at a small village called Upper Santan that was near Sakatan. A good morning, America called to say a crew was on its way for a live interview from the reservation. We got the word out through the reservation grapevine, which is faster than email, that children who wanted to be on national TV should come to the mission at dawn. So at 4 a.m. the next morning, after Dennis Burke bought the kids white poster boards and marking pens so they could say, Good morning, America, from Upper Santan, or whatever they wanted to write. There were about 10 children of different ages standing expectantly, holding their cardboard signs. <laughs> and Good Morning America scrubbed the interview in favor of a segment on wedding dresses. It was just not to be born. And my friend Duffy, who was driving the van for a while, saved the day. She got out her camera and took pictures of the kids <clears throat> with their signs. Then she said, Hey kids, Granny D and I would like to walk you partway to school, okay? Well, let's go. Line up to a breast. That's it. And we all marched about a half a mile together down the road. I then saw the children off to school. I am a nothing, a nobody, but I honor you, and you are walking for me. The Indian people I have met are like people everywhere. They have their own dreams and traditions and problems. My son Jim met three of their problems, drunk and mean, at this roadside general store. If any of you ever knew Jim, you know he does not scare easily. But he was afraid. He managed to get away. But he had to come back to New Hampshire. And he said to me, Ma, I have to go. You promise me you will keep an eye out on the road for those men. <laughs> and I walked on. Later, way down the road, I saw those three men approaching. What you have to understand is that Native American men here were once hunters, gatherers, and sometimes warriors throughout these deserts. And they had great, great commitments to their communities and their families. And the Indian Wars devastated them. So many of these men wander lost in guilt, and self-destruction because they can no longer care for their families. So what I saw approaching through the heat of the highway were three sad warriors 
returning from an impossible battle with nothing for their families. As they approached through the wavy heat of the highway, a great smile came to me. Hello! And they smiled and said, Hello! As we passed. Then on on to Pachaco Pass and Tucson and Tombstone and then the Chiricahua Mountains where I celebrated my 89th birthday. Tears ran down my cheeks. It had been hard. And I hoped my dear husband was looking down on me with a smile. We had had a wonderful life together. Some hard times, mainly due to the Great Depression. But we worked hard, we read like mad, we played, and we managed to spend and yet save enough money to put both our children through college. And then Alzheimer's came. And my wonderful, happy, intelligent husband went away. <clears throat> there were times, though, when he would come back and be quite lucid. And then we would rejoice and cry, because now he knew what was happening to his mind. Ten years of this suffering, and finally one day he came and said, Doris, my play has run. No more food or drink. When he took his last breath, my life stopped too. It stopped for a long time. And I walked on. New Mexico, New Mexico, and then I crossed the Pecos River and into Texas. <laughs> Big and wild and wonderful. Oh, I saw lots of interesting things. On one road on the way to Fort Worth, there was a fence strung with very large, does anyone know what these are? Catfish heads in fearsome degrees of decomposition. And what was that big? Oh <laughs> and I must say, you know, you hear that Texans are braggarts. Well, it's true. But one Texas brag is true. Their hearts are as big as their state. My son Jim told me that when I was taking a little cat nap in the van on this street in Fort Worth, a woman came up, parked her car, and walked over to Jim. Are, are you with that Granny D that's walking across America? Yes, I'm Jim, her son. Well, everybody I know suspects the worst, but nobody does nothing. She is, and, and uh, it ain't much. But the government's not running this country the way it should. 
Insurance is bad. I got grandbabies. They can't even get on insurance. And we are asking for your prayers and uh, your signatures, but not your money. This, this whole campaign is against money and to try to show that the people care and you care. And we appreciate that. Thank you. But that's what I want to do. You know, make sure she can get a place to, to sleep at night, you know, and, and get something to eat. Well, you tell her to give them hell. <laughs> I will. And thank you very much. Finally, I crossed the Red River out of Texas and entered the South. Oh, and if you are in the market for some August humidity and some dead pole cats and armadillos, I cannot recommend this stretch of road enough. I was constantly stepping around a great collection of unfortunate armadillos. It was as if some armadillo Spartacus fleeing Arkansas had been captured and executed with all his followers along this road. But here we were in Arkansas, Hope, Arkansas, Arkadelphia, and then Little Rock. And I was privileged to give a speech at the First Missionary Baptist Church where Martin Luther King once preached. It was not an easy crowd. But in the end, they were up on their feet, cheering. Left Arkansas and finally went into Tennessee. We were hiking through rolling hills and rainy green pastures set off by rail fences. Horses clopped over through the mud to take a look and see what was going on as we passed by. At one little farm, a dog and a goat, obviously old friends, they came out together to take a look at us. They were joined a few minutes later by a pig. I had the feeling their spider friend was back in the barn spelling out something. <laughs> But on toward Memphis, and at this point, writer-activist Dick Gregory walked with me. And I asked him, Mr. Gregory, do you think it's possible to join campaign finance reform movement with civil rights? Ooh, ooh, Granny D. Oh, you've got to understand how it works. For so many black people, the problem is the poverty right now. The poverty tonight. If there are roaches in the kitchen, if there are rats in the kids' room, you can't think much past that. People in poverty need to solve those kinds of problems before they can think about the big political issues. You see how it works? I understand that. But I think civil rights leaders should help to clean up the political system so that social justice reforms can be possible. If all our tax dollars are being diverted through corporate welfare because of the campaign finance system, people who truly need help cannot get it. The leaders understand that they need a second wind. Now all you have to worry about, Granny D, you just keep walking and let your feet do the talking. You're changing the way people think. 
You see how it works? You're making a difference. So you just be patient and let your feet do the talking. I wonder what it is like to be black. See, I think it is impossible for a white person to really understand what it is like to be a black person in America. When I was a young girl, I was barely aware other races existed. I never even had as much of a conversation with a black person until after high school graduation. And I took a job at a small hotel in Nantucket to earn money for my first year at Emerson. And I lived and worked with Ida Thomas, who was an African-American. Ida, I just don't understand how you must feel. Oh, honey, you'll understand something of it someday when an unfair thing hurts you deeply. The next summer, she was proved right. That summer, I was hired by a Mrs. P in Boston. And when she hired me, she offered to drive me to the house right then. So I opened the door of her great automobile to slide into the front seat beside her You'll sit in the back, Doris. And so I did. The dividing line was very clear, as I would learn. One Sunday, I was changing the sheets on Mrs. P's twin beds when my foot caught the electric cord to the lamp. Oh. I let Mrs. P have the news straight away when she entered the house. What is it, Doris? Come with me. She went to a telephone, dialed a number. You step. Frank. One of my servants has broken the lamp by my bedside. Send me a duplicate. Oh, well, it's hard to get good help nowadays. Clumsy oaf. Well, I would discharge her, but the next one would probably be just as bad. Well, the expense can't be helped. Oh, yes. A total idiot. I felt real hatred and scar tissue forming deep in me. It would stay there for my whole life. But I stood there and I took it time after time rather than defending my human dignity. I was too wrapped up in my need for tuition and housing. And let me tell you something, the right thing comes at a price. I was not ready for that kind of courage. It changed me. I learned that it was possible to hate people and just celebrate <coughs> their misfortunes. <coughs> what would I be like if I had suffered my whole life from abuse and humiliation? These issues trace far deeper than we can touch with campaign finance reform. I squeezed Mr. Gregory's hand. That's all right. We will both do what we can. 
September 5th, I gave a speech right outside the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King Jr. had been murdered. I traced his last march and people wept and cheered. Coming out of Memphis, I finally understood what needed to be said and needed to be done. A lot of you already know this. You sit back most of your life and you assume that there are grown-ups, leaders somewhere <clears throat> running the show. But when you look behind the curtain, you will see it is just a bunch of tired people like yourself needing help trying their best and not doing half as well as they would like. That is the moment when you can grow up and take responsibility. Now, I was starting to get it. That was September 5th. By the end of September, I walked with Russ Feingold through Nashville, and he told me that the McCain-Feingold campaign finance reform bill was to be debated in the House the next day. I couldn't resist taking an extra day of rest to see the show. I jumped on a plane to Washington, and naturally, I stopped by the offices of our two New Hampshire senators. Bob Smith was in. I can't resort that bill. I'm not gonna support it. And I'm not too sure the folks back home will even care. The general public is too dumb to understand about money and politics. And, uh, Granny D, I have a great deal of respect for what you're doing. I wish I could say the same. <laughs> I went to that debate, and then I flew back to finish walking Tennessee, and then I entered Kentucky where I was to enter the lion's den. I was to give a speech in Louisville in the front steps of the office of the most dedicated, dedicated man for political bribery in the United <laughs> States Senate, Senator Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Well, I was trying to remember my Gandhi, you know, attack the ideas, not the man, but I thought I might fall short. <laughs> McConnell was presently in that debate heaping abuse upon McCain for daring to suggest that there might be corruption in Washington. And he was yelling at him, Senator McCain, you name one corrupt senator. Name one. And the closer I walked, the less I felt like obeying what I knew to be the proper way laid down for us. But I thought I might tell the truth as I saw it, and I did. So on November 6th, 1999 in Louisville, right outside Mitch McConnell's office, I gave a speech, and this was included in it. And I have also come here today to answer a question asked by Senator McConnell and to end his long search. <laughs> Who is corrupt in Washington? <laughs> Sir, you are the man you asked Senator McCain about, and you are not alone. 
The House and the Senate are full of some of the best minds and most caring hearts in America. And they are being ethically destroyed by the financial demands of campaigning in the modern age. So, I don't think Senator McConnell would have been happy to see how people honked and gave me the thumbs up <laughs> for days after my speech was printed in the Louisville paper. <laughs> so I walked on. Sometimes my schools where children shouted and clapped and said, Granny D, Granny D. At one school, a little girl ran up and gave me a lion. Cause y'all are brave as a lion. <laughs> <coughs> well, finally, I crossed the Ohio River, leaving the South, and into Chillicothe, Ohio. I thought, access <laughs> is the soul of politics, and that is why it should never be sold for cash. Many times on this trip, I walked alone, but on December 18, my old walking buddy, Ken Heckler, and 74 other people were waiting to walk me across this bridge and welcome me into West Virginia. And then the hills, the dreaded hills. I had dreaded them from the beginning, and I was right to do so. Steep grades and icy shoulders. One foot in front of the other, Doris. I climbed and walked. Climbed and walked. Climbed. But on December 23rd, I saw the biggest and brightest moon in 133 years. 16 degrees cold. We took a Christmas break to get warm. For some days after that, I walked alone up steep, steep hills with the van being driven up ahead. The margins of the road were caked in oily ice, so every step had to be deliberately calculated. It was steep hill after steep hill.
up over that crest and into Cumberland. Cumberland, Maryland. And guess what? I celebrated my 90th birthday. Cumberland, Maryland, and a large crowd led me through town, waving flags and singing, this land is your land, this land is my land, this land was made for you and me. And then <laughs> came the area's worst snowstorm in four years. How was I to walk? But there was that canal, that canal, and a towpath beside it. And I cross-country skied 184 miles right into that wonderful neighborhood of D.C., Georgetown. Almost there. I went to Arlington. I went to Arlington, and then on a bagpipe here. Oh, I and he led me through the streets of Washington, right to the Capitol. I climbed up the east steps of the Capitol to give my final speech. <laughs> Thank you. This morning, we walked among the graves of Arlington so that those spirits might join us and we might ask, brave spirits, did you give your lives for a government of, by, and for the people? Or did you give your lives for a government where anything and everything is done for a price. I will not call such a thing a treason, but those whose blood runs through our flag and our history might use such a word. Shame on you, senators and congressmen, who have turned this headquarters of a great and self-governing people into a body house. But let me speak to us. The problems we see here of our own doing, it is not enough to elect someone and send them off. We must energize our towns and cities and states to better see our problems and better plan our happy futures. This is the duty of every adult American. And senators, if I have offended you speaking this way on your front steps, that is as it should be. You have offended America and dishonor the best things it stands for. How did you dare think we do not care for our country? How did you dare think we would not come here to these steps to denounce your corruptions? How did you dare think that we were so unpatriotic as to have forgotten those rows upon rows of graves that mark how much we as a people care for our freedom and equality. The people of our nation do care. They have told me so. So here we are, senators, at your doorstep. We, the people, the time has come, senators, for some reform or for some new senators. 
tell us which it will be, and then we will go vote. In the name of the people who have sent me here to you, and in the name of the generations before who have sacrificed so much, I make this demand. <laughs> God, I don't care if I'm a fool for my country.